chapters fifty one through seventy five of Sonnets of William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sam Stinson. Chapter fifty one. Thus can my love excuse the slow offence of my dull bearer when from thee I speed from where thou art. Why should I haste me thence, till I return of posting is no need? O oh, what excuse will my poor beast then find, when swift extremity can seem but slow? Then should I spur, though mounted on the wind? In winged speed no motion shall I know? Then can no horse with my desire keep pace, therefore desire of perfect love being made? Shall nay no dull flesh in his fiery race, but love? for love, thus shall excuse my jade, since from thee going he went wilful slow, towards thee I'll run, and give him leave to go. End of chapter 51 Chapter 52 So am I as the rich, whose blessed key can bring him to his sweet up-locked treasure, the which he will not every hour survey, for blunting the fine point of seldom pleasure, Therefore are feasts so solemn and so rare, Since seldom coming in that long year set, Like stones of worth they thinly placed are, Or capped in jewels and the carcinet. So is the time that keeps you as my chest, Or as the wardrobe which the robe doth hide, To make some special instant special blest, By new unfolding his imprisoned pride. Blessed are you whose worthiness gives scope, being had to triumph, being lacked to hope. End of chapter 52 Chapter 53 What is your substance? Whereof are you made, that millions of strange shadows on you tend? Since every one hath every one one shade, and you but one, can every shadow lend? Describe Adonis and the counterfeit, is poorly imitated after you. On Helen's cheek all art of beauty set, And you in Grecian tires are painted new. Speak of the spring, and foison of the year, The one doth shadow of your beauty show, The other as your bounty doth appear, And you in every blessed shape we know, And all external grace you have some part, But you like none, none you for constant heart. End of chapter 53 Chapter 54 O oh, how much more doth beauty beauteous seem, By that sweet ornament which truth doth give! The rose looks fair, but fairer we it deem, For that sweet odour which doth in it live. The canker blooms half full as deep a dye, As the perfumed tincture of the roses, Hang on such thorns and plays wantonly, When summer's breath their masked buds discloses. But for their virtue only, is their show. They live unwooed, and unrespected fade, die to themselves, sweet roses do not sow. Of their sweet deaths are sweetest odours made. And so of you, beauteous and lovely youth, when that shall fade, by verse distills your truth. End of chapter 54 Chapter 55 Not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme. But you shall shine more bright in these contents than unswept stone be smeared with sluttish time. When wasteful war shall statues overturn, and broils root out the work of masonry, nor Mars his sword nor war's quick fire shall burn the living record of your memory against death and all oblivious enmity Shall you pace forth, your praise shall still find room, Even in the eyes of all posterity That wear this world out to the ending doom. So till the judgment that yourself arise, You live in this, and dwell in lovers' eyes. End of chapter 55 Chapter 56 Sweet love, renew thy force, Be it not said thy edge should blunter be than appetite, which but to-day by feeding is allayed, 
tomorrow sharpened in his former might. So love be thou, although to-day thou fill thy hungry eyes, even till they wink with fullness. Tomorrow see again, and do not kill the spirit of love with a perpetual dullness. Let this sad interim, like the ocean, be, which parts the shore, where two contracted new come daily to the banks, that when they see return of love, more blessed may be the view. Or call it winter, which being full of care, makes summer's welcome, thrice more wished, more rare. End of chapter 56 Chapter 57 Being your slave, what should I do but tend, upon the hours and times of your desire? I have no precious time at all to spend, nor services to do till you require, nor dare I chide the world without end hour, whilst I, my sovereign, watch the clock for you, nor think the bitterness of absence sour when you have bid your servant once adieu, nor dare I question with my jealous thought, where you may be, or your affairs suppose, but like a sad slave stay and think of naught, save where you are, how happy you make those. So true a fool is love, that in your will, though you do anything, he thinks no ill. End of chapter 57 Chapter 58 That, God forbid, that made me first your slave, I should in thought control your times of pleasure, or at your hand the account of hours to crave, being your vassal, bound to stay your leisure. O oh, let me suffer, being at your beck, the imprisoned absence of your liberty, and patience tamed to sufferance, bide each cheek, without accusing you of injury. Beware, you list, your charter is so strong, that you yourself may privilege your time to what you will, to you it doth belong, yourself to pardon of self-doing crime. I am to wait, though waiting so be hell, nor blame your pleasure, be it ill or well. End of chapter 58 Chapter 59 If there be nothing new, but that which is, hath been before, how are our brains beguiled which laboring for invention bear amiss the second burthen of a former child? O oh, that record could with a backward look, even of five hundred courses of the sun, show me your image in some antique book, since mind at first in character was done, that I might see what the old world could say to this composed wonder of your frame, whether we are mended, or whether better they, or whether revolution be the same. O oh, sure I am the wits of former days, to subjects worse have given admiring praise. End of chapter 59 Chapter 60 Like as the waves make towards the pebbled shore, so do our minutes hasten to their end, each changing place with that which goes before, and sequent toil all forwards do contend. Nativity once in the main of light crawls to maturity wherewith being crowned. Crooked eclipses gainst his glory fight, and time that gave doth now his gift confound. Time doth transfix the flourish set on youth, and delves the parallels in beauty's brow, feeds on the rarities of nature's truth, and nothing stands but for his scythe to mow. And yet, to times in hope, my verse shall stand, praising thy worth, despite his cruel hand. End of chapter 60 Chapter 61 Is it thy will, thy image should keep open my heavy eyelids to the weary night? Dost thou desire my slumbers should be broken, while shadows like to thee do mock my sight? Is it thy spirit that thou sendest from thee, so far from home into my deeds to pry, to find out shames and idle hours in me, the scope and tenure of thy jealousy? Oh, no, thy love, though much, is not so great. It is my love that keeps mine eye awake, mine own true love that doth my rest defeat, to play the watchman ever for thy sake. For thee watch I, 
whilst thou dost wake elsewhere, from me far off, with others all too near. End of chapter 61 Chapter 62 Sin of self-love possesseth all mine eye, and all my soul, and all my every part. And for this sin there is no remedy. It is so grounded inward in my heart, methinks no face so gracious is as mine, no shape so true, no truth of such account. And for my self mine own worth do define, as I all other and all worths surmount. But when my glass shows me myself indeed, beated and chopped with tant antiquity, mine own self-love quite contrary I read, self, so self-loving were iniquity. Tis thee, myself, that for myself I praise, painting my age with beauty of thy days. End of chapter 62 Chapter 63 Against my love shall be as I am now, with time's injurious hand crushed and o'erworn, when hours have drained his blood and filled his brow with lines and wrinkles, when his youthful morn hath travelled on to age's steepy night. And all those beauties whereof now he's king are vanishing, or vanished out of sight, stealing away the treasure of his spring. For such a time do I now fortify against confounding age's cruel knife that he shall never cut from memory my sweet love's beauty though my lover's life his beauty shall in these black lines be seen and they shall live in he and them still green end of chapter sixty three chapter sixty four when i have seen by time's fell hand defaced the rich proud cost of outworn buried age when sometime lofty towers i see down raised, and brass eternal slave to mortal rage, when I have seen the hungry ocean gain advantage on the kingdom of the shore, and the firm soil win of the watery main, increasing store with loss and loss with store, when I have seen such interchange of state, or state itself confounded to decay, ruin hath taught me thus to ruminate, that time will come and take my love away. This thought is, as a death which cannot choose but weep to have that which it fears to lose. End of chapter 64 Chapter 65 Since brass, nor stone, nor earth, nor boundless sea, but sad mortality or sways their power, how with this rage shall beauty hold a plea whose action is no stronger than a flower? Oh, how shall summer's honey breath hold out against the rackful siege of battering days, when rocks impregnable are not so stout, nor gates of steel so strong but time decays? O oh, fearful meditation, where, alack, shall time's best jewel from time's chest lie hid? Or what strong hand can hold his swift foot back? Or who his spoil of beauty can forbid? O oh, none, unless this miracle have might, that in black ink my love may still shine bright. End of chapter 65 Chapter 66 Tired with all these, for restful death I cry, as to behold desert a beggar born, and needy nothing trimmed in jollity, and purest faith unhappily forsworn, and gilded honor shamefully misplaced, and maiden virtue rudely strumpeted, and right perfection wrongfully disgraced, and strength by limping sway disabled, and art made tongue-tied by authority, and folly, doctor-like, controlling skill, and simple truth miscalled simplicity, and captive good attending captain ill. Tired with all these, from these would I be gone, save that to die I leave my love alone. End of chapter 66 Chapter 67 Ah, wherefore with infection should he live, and with his presence grace and piety, that sin by him advantage should achieve, and lace itself with his society? Why should false painting imitate his cheek, and steel dead seeming of his living hue? Why should poor beauty indirectly seek roses of shadow, since his rose is true? 
why should he live now nature bankrupt is beggared of blood to blush through lively veins for she hath no exchequer now but his and proud of many lives upon his gains o oh, him she stores to show what wealth she had and days long since before these last so bad end of chapter sixty seven chapter sixty eight thus is his cheek the map of days outworn when beauty lived and died as flowers do now before these bastard signs of fair were born or durst inhabit on a living brow before the golden tresses of the dead the right of sepulchres were shorn away to live a second life on second head ere beauty's dead fleece made another gay in him those holy antique hours are seen without all ornament itself in true making no summer of another's green robbing no old to dress his beauty new in him as for a map doth nature store to show false art what beauty was of yore End of chapter sixty eight. Chapter sixty nine. Those parts of thee that the world's eye doth view want nothing that the thoughts of hearts can mend. All tongues, the voice of souls, give thee that do, uttering bare truth, even so as foes commend. Thy outward thus with outward praise is crowned, but those same tongues that give thee so thine own. And other accents do this praise confound by seeing farther than the eye hath shown. They look into the beauty of thy mind, and that in guess they measure by thy deeds. Then churls their thoughts, although their eyes were kind, to thy fair flower add the rank smell of weeds. But why thy odour matcheth not thy show? The soil is this, that thou dost common grow. End of chapter sixty nine. Chapter seventy. That thou art blamed shall not be thy defect, for slander's mark was ever yet the fair, the ornament of beauty is suspect, a crow that flies in heaven's sweetest air, so thou be good, slander doth but approve thy worth, the greater being wooed of time, for canker vice the sweetest buds doth love and thou present'st a pure unstained prime thou hast passed by the ambush of young days either not assailed or victor being charged yet this thy praise cannot be so thy praise to tie up envy evermore enlarged if some suspect of ill masked not thy show then thou alone kingdoms of hearts shouldst owe end of chapter seventy chapter seventy one no longer mourn for me when I am dead. Then you shall hear the surly sullen bell give warning to the world that I am fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. Nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it, for I love you so, that I in your sweet thoughts would be forgot if thinking on me then should make you woe. Oh, if, I say, you look upon this verse when I, perhaps, compounded em with clay do not so much as my poor name rehearse but let your love even with my life decay lest the wise world should look into your moan and mock you with me after i am gone end of chapter seventy one chapter seventy two oh lest the world should task you to recite what merit lived in me that you should love after my death dear love forget me quite for you and me can nothing worthy prove, Unless you would devise some virtuous lie, To do more for me than mine own desert, And hang more praise upon deceased eye, Than Nagard truth would willingly impart. O oh, lest your true love may seem false in this, That you for love speak well of me untrue, My name be buried where my body is, And live no more to shame nor me nor you, for I am shamed by that which I bring forth, and so should you, to love things nothing worth. End of chapter 72 Chapter 73 That time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs, where late the sweet birds sang, 
and me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west which by and by black night doth take away death's second self that seals up all in rest in me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie as the deathbed whereon it must expire consumed with that which it was nourished by this thou perceivest which makes thy love more strong to love that well which thou must leave ere long end of chapter seventy three chapter seventy four but be contented when that fell arrest without all bail shall carry me away my life hath in this line some interest which for memorial still with thee shall stay when thou reviewest this thou dost review the very part was consecrate to thee the earth can have but earth which is his due my spirit is thine the better part of me so then thou hast but lost the dregs of life the prey of worms my body being dead the coward conquest of a wretch's knife too base of thee to be remembered the worth of that is that which it contains and that is this and this with thee remains End of chapter seventy four chapter seventy five so are you to my thoughts as food to life or as sweet season showers are to the ground and for the peace of you i hold such strife as twixt a miser and his wealth is found now proud as an enjoyer and anon doubting the filching age will steal his treasure now counting best to be with you alone then better that the world may see my pleasure sometime all full with feasting on your sight and by and by clean starved for a look possessing or pursuing no delight save what is had or must from you be took thus do i pine and surfeit day by day or gluttoning on all or all away end of chapter seventy five